Welcome back to another episode of the Punch Out Podcast. We got Nick Silva on today, special guest, a former college teammate of mine from Miami. We played together at the University of Maine, both graduated at the same time. Nick went on to play with the Chicago White Sox, so he's got some pretty good stories with that, and uh, we're going to get into it. We, we, he's somebody that came from Miami to come all the way up to Maine and play college baseball. We play Division One baseball, too, I might add. Some people, uh, we've gotten ask all around, oh, are you guys division one at Maine? And sure are. We play all of the best. We beat Miami. We, there's so many good stories that we're going to get into. So they put on the mound at Clemson. Yes, sir. So we got so many good times to talk about and, and some good stories to tell too, because we beat, we beat Clemson. We beat Miami. I mean, there's, there's some good times in there, but Nick, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So you're a, you're a Miami guy. We ended up playing some games down there, but what was it like growing up down there? It's literally talent hotbed. You've got first rounders that come out of down there. What was, what was it like for you growing up playing some baseball? In Miami, it's, it's definitely fun and it's an experience playing there. You know, there's, like you said, there's so much, so much talent. There's division one guys crawling in, in every school, not just, not just one powerhouse school. Like, Every school has one or two guys who are, who are going to be dudes in, in some places. So it's hard to stand out. But, you know, just if, if you compete and put up good numbers, you'll, you'll find your way out. And, and some good schools or, or scouts will come and find you. And you can almost sometimes use it to your advantage where you've got the big time players on your team or you're playing against them. So you're going to naturally have more scouts show up at your games anyways because – oh, there's somebody over on the other side that's going to be a first rounder or whatever. So w growing up, though, playing travel ball, was that kind of the, the culture down there was to get out and, and play in all these tournaments right away? Exactly. That's exactly the culture. Like, So like you said, that Kami said about playing against players who are big names, so there's always naturally a lot of scouts and stuff. Like, that's how I ended up at Maine. We had uh, Danny, who was obviously committed to Maine already. He was he was one of the our big prospects down there, and uh, Coach Trimper, or Coach Derba came down to watch him, and I happened to be pitching that day, and I threw well, and I was doing hard, and they ended up offering me a couple weeks later. So, like that's that's how I benefited out of it. Like you know, that's how I made my I stood out. But in summer ball, it's just you play all these games. The good thing about Florida is the weather is perfect throughout 12 months. So we play fall ball, spring ball, summer ball. So it's nonstop. And, and the goal is to play as many tournaments as you can and, and get exposed to all these different schools and, and scouts. And when you were going through it, uh, like, did you play the Little League all the way through? Like, what was it kind of like? Is everybody, is it, I feel like at least so in Maine, everybody plays Little League. People drop off when it gets 13, 14. People really drop off 15 and 16. And then high school, it's whoever's left, basically. Was it, was it the same in Florida? Or, you know, there's so many people down there. So I, I kind of wonder what that feels like. Well, so, yeah, it's like it's the same way. The drop off is there's always drop off at every level, you know, because some kids get better and, and advance or, or some kids just don't, don't get better at all. And, and they end up picking something new, you know. But uh, I think the difference is, like, kids over there, since they could play year-round, there's no breaks, really. They just, they just uh, get better at a faster pace because they're, they're training so often and playing the game so often, so they're getting, they're getting really comfortable with the sport, you know. And then when you take that up to, to somewhere where maybe the kids haven't played as much, then that's why you see Florida, California, Texas – you know, all those schools tip or states typically have the best schools for baseball or for sports in general, because if you practice more, you can get better faster. And, and I think with us playing at Maine and just kind of exposing the community a little bit more, because baseball is not the sport up here in Maine, it's, it's hockey. And for people to, to realize that, like, if you practice baseball year round, uh, you know, you don't have to be throwing off the mound year round, but the more you practice, the, the better that you can get. And so even if you do run up against the Florida kids like the, I mean, like when we come down to play 
Miami or even in like travel ball, if we can keep it there, you know, when you go down to Georgia to play at the perfect game tournaments and you got all these kids, you know, everybody, this, this guy on your team in Florida could have already thrown 85 innings on the year where some kid from Maine, like me would have only been throwing like 40th inning of the year, you know, but it's the catch 22 for the Florida kid too, or the, the kid with the, with the more, more time to throw outside. Cause it's like, you have more wear on your arm. So like one of the things that as scout, as a scout, like people I hear like is they love Northern arms because they have less wear and less, less mileage on their arm. Cause if they're throwing 95 and with strikes and they have very little innings in their past, that you mean, that means they have a bright future ahead, but some of these kids in Florida hit a wall. They, they peak too early, you know? I'm sure you've probably seen that with some, some people down there, like with all the tournaments and things like that, like, are there definitely cases where people get like pushed too much or are people starting to like smarten up a little bit or what's that like? Um, I mean, definitely people are starting to smart up, but I I've seen it a, a lot of times where, where kids are, are overexposed and overused at a young age and, and they just pan out to what, what people think they were. Cause just because of, you know, either getting tired of the game fatigue or, or just like, you know, just too much, you're too much wear on your body. So, so definitely though, I've seen, I've seen a lot of improvement with that in Florida. Kids are starting to manage their long toss and, and, and take care of the arm and, and, you know, limit their innings. But there's, there's definitely been a lot of cases of that not happening. That's really good. And I had Alex Fajardo on, on the podcast here a few episodes ago, and he was he's from Tampa area, and, and he was talking about how he was kind of a late bloomer as far as pitching goes. And, and, you know, he's six foot five and big dude, but he really, like, grew into his body late and, you know, had the experience of, like, his first two years, he said he touched the mound, like, three or four times a year because he just wasn't good. But things kind of clicked a little bit later for him. Where it, you kind of had the same type of uh, story a little bit. Like, what was it like for you kind of being a late bloomer and, you know, <laughs> take me through your, like, high school development or anything like that a little bit. Just what it, what it was like from freshman year all the way to freshman year of college. Wow. I mean, I was the latest of late bloomers. I was – Freshman year of high school, I, I don't even think I threw 75 miles an hour. Like, if I threw 75 miles an hour, I was lucky. And then I had a little a little growth spurt somewhere in, in high school. And then by my junior year, I was probably touching, like, 83 because I, I grew into my body a little bit. And then by my senior year of high school, I touched 85 for the first time. And I was, like, a, a miracle. And then I happened to have – gotten an offer from University of Maine because I don't know they they ended up liking me I, I threw a lot of strikes so they offered me and then I got to Maine and and they put us on this strength program with Coach Lynch and and I was starting to throw every single day we had practice six times a week that's something I wasn't used to but you know the the, the level of practice and, and competition was a lot harder and so my arm actually took a liking to that and that fall, I touched 90 for the first time. And I was like, that was that skip four miles an hour. I just like went from like 85, 86 to 90 that fall. And then then first game of the season at Clemson, first pitch I threw was 93. And I was like, whoa, like, so like that, that just shows that I was a late bloomer. I, I, I did not expect that to happen at all when I was in high school. And it's, and you still got even more after that too. So that's the thing is yeah, yeah. people don't realize, you know, everybody gets caught up with, you know, where you are on a prospect list or maybe a, a perfect game rating or a top velocity or something like that. But if you keep putting the work in and stuff like that, it, it you at least give yourself the chance. And like yeah. for you, you're talking about a little bit like weightlifting and, and get in the weight room. Like when do you think, it all kind of clicked. Like, were you lifting it all in high school or something like that? That that seems like a lot of the kids, at least the feedback that I've gotten from the the podcast so far is they're like, Oh, I didn't realize how important strength and conditioning is. And it's huge. So can you talk about that for a little bit? 
It's extremely huge. Like, I mean, since a kid, I, I've always lifted, but like I was never on a, on a strict program. Like, you know, it was lift when you can or, you know, when or, or after a game. But when I finally got to college, it was like, it was, we throw every day. We lift th four or five times a week and we're lifting heavy with, with coach Lynch. And, and it was actually a real structured program that, that was, you know, drilled and drilled into us and, and it was fitted for each person personally. So I guess my body ended up taking a liking to that. Plus, you know, growing into my body a little bit more and it worked out well for me, but lifting is, is huge in, in order to, to gain velocity and, and take care of your arm. Most importantly, health, you know, that keeps you healthy. Yeah. Cause people say that pitching is the fastest move in all sports and you put the craziest amount of stress on your body and if you're not strong enough to handle it then that ligament or that shoulder is going to take the hit and if you don't take care of your arm that's something i've talked about before with my own arm that's why i had tommy john surgery i threw hard and didn't really take care of it or when i was younger yeah. do some bands and that was it you know <laughs> go out and play shortstop or outfield or whatever but there's so much kind of behind the scenes that i don't think people get to see yeah. but uh in Florida, I'm curious with with your high school, you know, Christopher Columbus being so prestigious and, and you guys win baseball games all the time. Was yeah. your high school pitching coach a, a pretty big help uh, as far as, you know, learning how to throw curveballs or change-ups? Because your change-up is nasty. Like, what, what was your high school pitching coach like? My high school pitching coach was probably the best, one of the best, or if not the best pitching coach I ever had. Like, he was just like, just the way that he coached and like said things to me. It, it got into my head. Like he was a, like a no nonsense guy. So like, if you, you throw three balls in a row and you look into that dugout, you might have somebody like warming up already. So it was like that kind of, that kind of mindset kind of just like, you know, you know, kept me straight and, and, you know, just the way that in our bullpens, like the confidence that he would have given to me or, or, you know, just like the little pointers that he would say every now and then, like the way that he would verbalize it, just sat well with me and, and, and made sense. So he, he was very good in that. And so much of it with coaching, at least that I've started to see with, you know, coaching some, some younger kids over the time is it's all in trying to communicate so that it makes sense to the player. Cause if I say something different, you might, or if I say the same, if me and your pitching coach said the same thing, but he said it differently and where it clicked, it doesn't matter where you get the information as long as you get it and it works. You could be the smartest guy in the world and not know how to verbalize the information that you have in your head. You, there's no use for it. It's, it's pretty much nothing. You can't do anything with that if you can't communicate your, your, your response or anything like that. And, and I think too, you know, both of us got to play for, for coach Clem out in the summertime. You know, that was my first experience with with Jim Clem out in Bellingham uh you know over in the summers we we had some good times playing in, in summer ball and stuff like that can you kind of you know take it take us through your your summer ball and, and kind of the stuff that you know sometimes people don't talk about it as much because it's not under the school's name where where people go off to in the summer times you know it's pretty common for for the division one guys to play their full college season you know 56 games and if you make the playoffs you've got more than that and then every player gets shipped out to whatever part of the country they want to. Basically, if you're good enough to play somewhere, they'll ship you off. And for me, I played in, in Seattle, Washington, or Bellingham, Washington, after my freshman year, which is completely the other side of the country. But uh, what, was, what was it like for you in, in summer ball? You got to go all around, too. I, I feel like my summer ball experience was – was the the uniform collecting tour? I went to four different places. It was it was so much fun. Summer ball. If the season is number one, summer ball is like right there. One one B. I I absolutely love the experience. I like you said. I I went to uh, Bellingham with you. We learned under Coach uh, Clem, who's also one of the best pinchy coaches I've ever had. Like he's like the Godfather. You know, just like very soft spoken, but everything he says is gold. Like he doesn't say much, but when he does it, you know, it's going to be some great content. And, 
I'm going to get him out. I got to get him on here for sure. You have to, you have, that would be the best guest. And then um, that was after my freshman year. And then my sophomore year after that season, I was lucky enough to get a temp on the Cape. And I spent two to three weeks there. I made two appearances and it was amazing, you know, playing with and against the top talent in the world. It was, it was cool just to you know, you know, to have that feeling that, that you belong there, you know, and, you know, the first outing that I had was very good and second one was not so great, but, but still it was, it was a, a great experience nonetheless. But, and then those are pretty much the two places that I remember most from summer ball and those are the best experiences. And you get to meet so many people too. Like that's the thing is when you go on to play after that too, like, you know, we had guys that you get almost every team. It was somebody on our team would know a guy from Mississippi state, Boston college, UMass Lowell, Miami. Like we went all the way to Texas tech and somebody still knew a guy on their team and whatever. Mm -hmm. So the relationships, that's probably the best part about it too. And, and just getting connected with everybody because you know, that's, that's kind of been a theme for, for this podcast is like, you know, the first few people were guys that I played with and things like that. And then you kind of expand your network from there. Uh, you know, your, your baseball network, you know, has got to be pretty, pretty well connected right now. You know, you want to, you want to talk about the, your experience there in 2009, you know, kind of torn all over, give people the backstory. I haven't, I haven't let anybody in on the which story is that the Oh nine, like, uh, like, you can, the World Series? you can take it any way you want to with the world series, with the parties, with the, all that. I mean, you can, you got to give people the backstory on, on your network and how you got it. Oh nine was probably one of the best years of my life. You know, the Yankees won the world series that year. So, and, uh, I was fortunate to to go to all six World Series games. My uncle was playing for them at the time, and and uh, I was I will never forget. I was in seventh grade, and uh, I told my my teachers, guys, I'm gonna be gone for two weeks. If you fail me, that's all right. I don't care. I'm <laughs> I'm going to the World Series. So, I, but I was I went to game one, two, three, four, five, six between New York and Philly, and. Uh, I got to experience all. I got to experience the the game six uh, win, clinch game clinching win, on the field and in the clubhouse with the Yankees and stuff, and you know the champagne, and then you know a couple of days later the 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 World Series float, like that was, that was sick with with Jay Z right there, like you know the fans throwing toilet paper at us and you know the confetti everywhere. Watching watching Jay Z and Alicia Keys perform uh, "Empire State of Mind" because that was like the number one song at the time. It was it was an, a crazy experience. The best two weeks of like my life ever. That's so cool. And your uncle played a, a pretty pretty big part in that series. Uh, that you could say, you go back yeah. and watch the you could go back and watch the video on that. But so you you had some baseball in your blood growing up and things like that. How much did did uh, you kind of lean on your uncle? And, and sort of just, you know, the knowledge of the game, you know, you have another cousin who's in the minor leagues too, Joe, we, we've got to get him on here. We, 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 the network is huge. So what, what was kind of that like growing up with, you know, a legend of the game, Alex Rodriguez, you know, right around? Those, it was definitely the, like, that's literally the greatest experience for like my baseball career that we could have possibly had. My cousin and I, Joe, we had the the luxury of, having a hall of famer or potential hall of famer he's going to be a hall of famer uh, a hall of famer in our contact list who we can call text facetime at any time of the day and if we're in a struggle or or anything like just ask him like hey what should i do better here or how can i improve my game here like i'm 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 struggling in this part of the game and you have a guy like that who's a hall of famer who's giving you advice and and also when he was still playing and training, we, we would be able to train with him and, and see what it takes to be a player like that, of, of that magnitude. So we got to learn firsthand of how to train like, a, like an all-star, how to, how to act like an all-star and how to, you know, do all the things that all-stars do. So that was, literally, that was the luxury of having him, you know. I think too, like, 
I think the training would probably be the coolest part. You get to yeah. kind of go behind the scenes a little bit and see what it's like, you know, at, and was there anything that kind of surprised you about, you know, like a big leaguer's work ethic? And he was, all, you know, <laughs> I'm sure other big leaguers probably referred to him as like a super big leaguer or something like that. Like what, what was the kind of behind the scenes like? It was surprised me. Like it didn't surprise me now knowing him, but it's like how crazy he was towards the game. Like he was doing things that, that other players wouldn't even imagine doing. He was waking up at five in the morning, going to the track and running and then, you know, going somewhere for a quick breakfast, like his, his routine, like his daily routine was out of this world that you would think he's like a lunatic. Like he'd train and run four or five times a day. And like, that was all before he even stepped, stuck foot on the foot baseball field. Like he would run, train, lift, recovery, all that before he even took ground balls and hit BP and stuff. Like that, that, that part came last. And then at night, like before bed, like he'd be, you know, he'd have his trainers coming over like to stretch him, like body recovery. Like he was, he was focused on, on his health and his, his body before that became like a, a thing to do. Like he was one of the first ones to really invest in himself and, and eat right and, and do, do the little things like that that would get him to the top. And that's why he got to the top and he stayed there. I think that's so cool too because – you know, everybody, it, it, it's starting to become more popularized, you know, with, with TB12 and, and with, you know, Russell Wilson was talking about his body coach and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you kind of get a taste of it, I'm sure, as you climb the ladder a little bit like at, at UMaine and in Division One baseball, you got a trainer with you all the time. You can, you can kind of get things worked on. And, you know, the more specific and the more personalized that you can make your, your training programs, I feel like the, the better off that you get. And, you know, yeah. you can't, it doesn't get any better than that, having a guy with you all the time and, and things like that. But when uh, – let's let's go for a little bit after college. You know, you, you take me through – take me through draft day a little bit for you and, and what it was like. That's mm -hmm. always the best – those are always the best stories when people get to talk about the – I mean, because you're going to remember it forever, where you were, what you were watching, everything. So let me hear the story. Draft day was the best – worst day ever because so day one happens obviously I know I'm not going day one or day two so I wasn't even worried then I was watching the draft just because I had friends who were getting drafted or people who we played against so then day three comes along I still haven't I didn't have any phone calls from the first two days but I had gotten calls that week and then my uncle my other uncle um he knew that I was going to be kind of nervous that day. He kind of just took me along with him and to do random errands like that. I would never do like, I'm like, why are we here? We're literally like shopping for a new pair of pants. Like, so he took me to do errands. Yeah, you're not a big shopper. I know. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just running random errands with him and, and, um, you know, draft round 20 goes 30 and I still haven't gotten a call. And we finally get home. I get to his house. And it's like about around 35 by now. And I'm like, I, I, in my head, I was like, it's done. My baseball career is over. Played my last game. It, well, it is what it is. So I left my uncle's house, like extremely angry, like, like ups, not angry, but like more upset. And then I get home and I'm, I'm literally home alone. Nobody's there. Cause I, I wanted just to be alone. And then um, I lay in my bed and then I, I, I had deleted the draft tracker and all that stuff from my phone. And I lay in my bed and I'm like, let me just give it one more look. And the, literally the second I clicked refresh, it was, like a, it was like a magic. Like my name popped up the second I clicked refresh. And I was like, that cannot be me. Like that's not, and then I saw main, I was like, that's me. And then all of a sudden, like two seconds later, my phone, blows up I get text messages calls from every single person in the world and then and then uh I call I call I call my mom I told her and then I call my dad and, and you know got a little emotional and it was it was crazy and it was and then I still did I still didn't believe it because I hadn't gotten called from a call from the scout yet they didn't call me till like an hour or two later because they were I guess dealing with the the first or second rounder that day 
So I was like, I, I was still in shock, but it was, it was a crazy day. What, what did they call you and say like an hour or two later? Like I would have been so stressed out. Like, okay, is this real? Like, you know, what is that like? So he basically said, hey, Nick, like, congratulations. We, we drafted you. Like, uh, sorry we didn't call earlier. We were, we were actually on the phone negotiating with the higher draft rounds. And I was like, oh, no, don't worry about it. I truly, I understand. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm just happy that it's me. <laughs> and then they asked me, like, oh, can you get on a flight? Uh, I think it happened, I don't know what, a couple days later. They said, can you get on a flight in two or three days? I said, yeah. Perfect. I can leave tomorrow if you want. <laughs> I already left yesterday. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, I, a couple of days later, I hopped on a flight and, and then I was there in Arizona. So cool. What, what, and then uh, over the summer too, you get to the Arizona league and things like that. What, what is, what was it kind of like, you know, kind of walk us through the summer and, and, and what was the season like? Oh man, it's that minor league life. Like, I know it's very cliche that people say it's a grind, but it, it truly is like, and that's that we were blessed playing in rookie ball, Arizona. Cause that's, that's their, like, you're in a palace there. You're, you're literally staying in the, in the spring training facility, major league training facilities. And, and all the drives are 40 minutes away is the longest one. So our daily routine would be, um, uh, Wake up probably around 10.30. Be at, you got to be at the field at noon. We have lift at 12.30. We would lift for about an hour. And then uh, grab a bite to eat. Get some uh, uh, stretching with the, with the therapist and all that stuff. And then we go out for like a full team practice. This is in Arizona in the middle of the summer. 115 degrees out this is heat like they I've never experienced in my life like this is such dry heat like you don't sweat you just like you just faint <laughs> from Miami to the complete opposite yeah. it's the complete opposite it's like like you don't even know that you're like getting dehydrated you all of a sudden like you're fielding a shaggy and then you're like whoa I'm really lightheaded right now it's like there's no warning signs before so they're like please drink a lot of water so we would have a full team practice, you know, we'd work on some infield, like, you know, some bun defenses, infield pitchers who, who need bullpens that day, throw bullpen, and then we shag BP. And then we come back inside for, uh, for, for lunch and, and just to, to cool down and, and we don't have for a couple hours. And then game, game would be in an hour or two later, six, six thirty game. And I feel like too, that's something completely different from college. Like that's a, a you don't have a full team practice before a game. Usually yeah, yeah. you're on the road traveling or you're at home, mm -hmm. you know, taking BP or doing your thing. You don't have a full team out there. So I feel like there's a little difference from college to, to minor leagues. Is there any other like kind of big differences or something you maybe didn't expect transitioning from college to pro ball? Was there something that jumped out at you? Probably the routine that they would have the pitchers go through. It's, it was very taxing on your arm at first, I guess, if you're not used to it. Like the, the band series, the, 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 all the medical stuff that they make us do. Like this is daily stuff that we do every day. You know, weighted balls, bands, stretches, uh, manual resistance. And by, by the end of it, your arm is like, you're dead. You're like, how can I throw today? But then as the weeks go on, like, your arm obviously got stronger. And it would show on the field, like, because when I showed up at, in Arizona, I was already almost 100 innings deep from Maine because I was starting. So my arm was, was dead. I was probably throwing 89 to 91. And then as this routine kept going, and we got deeper into the season, I, my velo started creeping up big time. I was probably 93 to 95. And, and I think it was definitely for that, that arm routine and arm care that they would have us going through. It's pretty cool too. If you ever want to shoot that program over to me, I'll take a look at it. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> got to find it on the archives. Yeah. 
that sounds pretty cool too because that's kind of what you're shooting for you know with such a long season you know we could even apply it to a high school kid too with the spring and the summer you want your arm to get stronger as the year goes on you know there's going to be times you're not going to feel your best every every time out and in and as a starter and a reliever you're in different roles and you know all that everything is different every time out but to have a routine that you stick with i feel like is huge you know to, to just basically add some consistency in your day and to know, okay, no matter what my arm feels like, I've got this to fall back on. You know, I know what I'm doing after the game. I know what I'm doing before, you know, and the routine kind of puts your mind at ease a little bit too, because you know, okay, before the game, I've done everything I've done, you know, I'm as ready as I'm ever going to be, let's go. And yeah. you got to pitch as a starter and a reliever throughout college and pro ball and all that. What do you what do you like better? What do you think the biggest differences are? This was always the hardest question. And anytime I, I remember throughout the draft process and you know, you and I would meet with some scouts or so we'd always they'd oh this was the first question that they'd ask me. Nick, do you like starting or relieving? And I truly didn't have an answer for them because I, I love both feelings. Like like there's like one in one end of the spectrum as a starter, you you have that process, that routine that you go through every day that 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 gets you ready for the game, which which I love. And then as a closer or reliever, like you have that one inning that that everything is on the liner, that it, this is a do or die situation. You're probably facing the third or fourth batter, and it's the highest leverage situation in the game. So it makes it the most fun. So it was always hard for me to choose, but. But doing both after doing both, I think I had the most success as a reliever, and I knew in college that if I eventually make it to pro ball, I would be a reliever. I think in college I mostly started because it was a necessity. We we needed starting pitching. If if all things were great, I think I would have been probably somewhere in the back end of the pen. But but I I like relieving probably. And it's it's completely different too. The the starters, you know, you show up to the game, you know, if you're pitching that day. Whereas a reliever, you show up to the ballpark, you got a chance to get in the game, which is yeah, it's gonna be so cool. I, and for me, I've been a starter most of the time, but I feel like, you know, you, whatever. I always said in the meetings, whatever's gonna get me a contract, <laughs> I will do that. And so, you, you got to be able to adapt to both. And and I think you were somebody that did it really well. So. You ever, do you have a special routine or something when you knew it was going to be the closer? You know, you knew the ninth was coming up or your inning was coming up. Do you have something, that, you know, that you like to do before the game? So you just kind of – I mean, you obviously go into the game knowing your role. Like, in Pro Bowl, I know I was a middle reliever, like the the old snap guy. Like, if a starter come in it – if the starter is, is kind of getting hit and they need somebody to bridge a gap, I knew that that was me. So, so in Pro Bowl – if I saw our starter kind of fatiguing or, or struggling, or there's a big, I, you know, I just start stretching without, without them even calling the pen. I just, you know, get, get my arm loose, just start doing a little bands, maybe warming up my legs and then waiting for that call. So once that call happens, then that process doesn't start the process. The process is already started. So once that call is, I'm ready to get off the mound and throw a couple pitches. So I think knowing your role, and expecting when you think you'd be in the game is, is important as a reliever. Cause I mean, if you, if you guess wrong, if, if you're stretching and, and they say, Oh, the other guy's warming up, no, no, no harm. All you're doing is warming up. It's not like you're, you're wasting bullets. Right. That's a, that's huge. I think that's probably one of the biggest, the, the best lessons that, that somebody shared so far is like, you got to watch the game and you kind of got to predict a little bit, you know, you can't yeah. just sit there up oh, phone rings. It's me. Yeah, a couple arm circles here. We're, let's go. It doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. You know, there's there's nobody in this world that's going to roll out of bed and throw a hundred. You know, you got to be able to watch the game. Like if you see some of the greats, like you see Mariano Rivera in in the Yankees bullpen for so many years, you wouldn't see him. You wouldn't see him at all until the sixth inning. He he'd probably be in the clubhouse chilling, and then in the sixth inning, seventh inning, you see him creep his way into the bullpen. In the seventh inning, you might see him have the bullpen jacket on and he's starting to move his arm. Eighth inning, you see him probably doing some bands. 
getting some getting his legs loose so that by the time it's the ninth inning he's ready to, he he's already warm and ready to go ready to get off the mound it's not he's not waiting for that call and then going you know right and even if you're a starter you know if you if you go to a big league game and watch you know you see the starter come out of the dugout at 6 30 and start ripping balls across the outfield there is mm -hmm. so much that happens before that you know they you know there's different people like trevor bauer is going to show you his routine and you know be out there with the shoulder tube and all that but but like walker bueller let's give him as an example i saw a game in atlanta with him the dodgers versus atlanta the game acuna hit a grand slam off him but yeah but he started his warm-up and i swear to god his, he was 60 feet away from the catcher in the outfield and the ball came out 100 miles an hour on his first throw and i was like there is no way that he just walked out of that tunnel and threw a hundred. And, and it, I listened to some, you know, I did some research on it and he's like, no, no, I literally am an hour and a half before the game, hot tub, this, that weighted well, ball stretch. He got a lift in. He was with the, with the personal trainers. He was with, got a stretch in. He, he's ready to go. That's what I try to tell people is like, there is so much more behind the scenes. And, you know, with these podcasts and things like that, people kind of drop hints and like, okay, so I get to stretch before this time, you know, and that's kind of the goal with all of this is kind of like share some stories, share some experiences of like, okay, maybe this is how I can do it. Or, or if, you know, if I have to start or I have to go into this game as a reliever, all right, maybe I can do some stretching before, you know, because you're only at least people that I, I've spoken to, you know, your high school pitching coach or whoever is around you for coaches, they're kind of the ones that run the show. So if you kind of have that background knowledge of, you know, okay, I know what I need to get ready. And if you take care of that, once, once you get on the field, you just kind of let your talent take over and exactly. that's all, that's all you can do. And I feel like you're somebody who, who's had the late bloomer experience, you know, you've kind of learned as things have gone along and, and it came into the Chicago White Sox taking you, which, you know, you can't script it any better than that. But I got one last question before I, before I let you go with the White Sox, you know, the data is starting to come up huge. You know, you see it on broadcast. Now the commentators talk about it all the time. Is there something that maybe you saw with the White Sox or they were telling you about your own pitches that you didn't know, or, or what kind of was that learning experience like for you? So with the White Sox, historically, they were kind of always, you know, behind in, in analytics. But when I got there, you could see that they were making that those steps forward to to trying to be more data driven and, <clears throat> and analytics driven. So my when I was there, they we had a meeting with our uh, our pitching coordinator and he came in and told, he asked me because I had I guess I had an above average spin rate on on my curveball. He asked me how to grip it, and, and he, he kind of readjusted my grip so that I can probably get a little bit more RPMs. And then he, he went in also in detail of, like, which areas of the zone I'm more effective because I wasn't a sinker guy. My ball was more flat. So with, with the analytic, with the data from my pitches, he said that it was probably more helpful for me and beneficiary if I threw up and away. That was like my my hot zone for to get out, but they were definitely uh, becoming more data driven. And then my when I reported for spring training, I actually threw a bullpen, you know, fully almost new, you know, in, in my sliders with all the with all the markers and stuff, and markers and and everywhere. And it was so cool, like. I literally was wearing a helmet while throwing and in my sliders and I felt naked and it felt weird, but, but it was cool. Cause you see all the, like on the TV, on the monitor behind us, you'd see like the biomechanics of like, of what I was doing and the velocity and the spin rate and all that stuff. But, and then a couple weeks later, they were going to give us our, our results cause it takes a while to process, but then COVID happened and we never got those results. But it was just say email them to me. I, I want to check those out. <laughs> That's pretty sweet though. I'd always like to try something like that. And the, the helmet would screw with me a little bit, but you probably knowing you, you probably still able to run it up pretty good in the bullpen like that. Yeah. I, I was throwing, I was throwing pretty hard that day, but it was definitely weird because like, you know, I'm, I'm usually a pretty sweaty guy when I'm playing. So I had nothing to wipe me out. Like, you know, not even a hat, like, you know, to, to wipe off some sweat. So I was like, 
that was the hardest part for me. I was sweating everywhere and I had nothing to wipe off. I was like, I was just soaking wet the whole time. That's super funny. Nobody ever talks about that. And of course it's in Arizona too, because yeah. that's where the that's where the home is. But that's such a good story. I, if I ever if I ever throw a bullpen like that, I'm gonna have to, you know, bring a towel or something. Oh, good. <laughs> my advice. Yeah, that's pretty good. And I never knew about the up and away thing. I, I was kind of wondering what if if people were ever to make models for for people, you know, like high school kids or anything, like college guys, like we never got talked about that in, in at Maine. Like, what do you? Why they say that up and away was was so good for you? I don't know. I guess I guess that was just my hot my hot zone. I guess it it complemented my my pitch as well. Maybe maybe because of the split or or my big loopy breaking ball, but definitely up in the zone is where they said I I played the best, like down and in and down and away is mostly where I got myself in trouble, obviously middle as well. But my stuff played better up and then, you know, split and breaking ball, dirt, you know. That's interesting too, because you you hear a lot of it on TV now. You know, you see the pitchers too, they're running up 97, 98, up in the zone. I wonder what it would take for somebody to be effective down, you know, because at least doing some more research over this, this time, like my spin rate is lower, like Mm -hmm. I'm around 2000 for my fastball, which is way lower than anybody's, you know, way lower than average, let's say. And so like my stuff is going to play better down. And if I throw up in the zone, it's going to get whacked because it's doesn't carry as well as, you know, Mm -hmm. let's somebody like a a Walker Bueller, as an example, that ball literally looks like it's a rise ball. So if you can kind of know your strengths, you know, that's probably why you were able to do so well right off the bat was like, you know what, you know, what's going to get stuff out, you know, what's going to get people and you kind of roll with that and pitch to your strengths rather than the hitters weaknesses. Cause I'm sure the scouting reports get better as you climb higher and higher too. No doubt. No doubt. And you never want to, if you get defeated, you never want to get defeated off, you know, trying to play against their strengths. If, you, if you're going to go down, you're going to go down with your best. So like, that's always what I say too. Like, like if the game's on the line, throw your best pitch, man. Don't, don't try to, because this guy's a good fastball hitter and, and your fastball is your best pitch. Don't not throw your fastball. You yeah. Know? Maybe he can't hit your fastball. Like yeah. that's the take. Go out, go out on your pitch. Go out on, go out on your best. Absolutely. No, I, I think we had a good interview today. It was fun, you know, catching up and telling stories and things like that. So, but, but thank you for, for coming on today and we got to get everybody following. We got to get, now we got to get the corp. We got to get, they following Nick Silva 17. We got to get everybody out. You know, you you got more followers than I do right now, but I'm coming up. I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah no, you're, you're coming up. You're, you, you made those followers quick. So I, I need to, I need to keep going up. I'm going to try to shoot everybody over to your way, though. Nick Silva, 17, you got to follow him. You know, he's got a whole bunch of stuff. You'll see him traveling all over the place. And and uh, we'll, we'll have maybe a repeating, a recurring guest. You know, maybe we'll tap into that network, too. We'll we'll, we'll see what's what's things are looking like behind the scenes. And hopefully we get back to baseball and, you know, maybe some normal things coming here soon. So thanks for coming along again, Nick. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.